Welcome to Comedy by Indie Drop-In. Each week, we feature an episode from the best independent creators. Hit subscribe for more great comedy content. If you would like to support Indie Drop-In and get these episodes ad-free, check out our Patreon at the bottom of the show notes. Today's episode is from Petri Dish. Don't forget to check out the show notes for links to subscribe and follow on social media. Enjoy the show. Begin. Petri Dish is a product of Petri Dish Media, all rights reserved. Petri Dish is a science comedy podcast and should not be used as medical advice. Do not get medical advice from a podcast. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words... Ich bin ein Science! Science! Yes. Science! I know the human being and science! Science! Can cause just peaceful. This was our finest. Guys, this is Petri Dish. I'm Nathan. I'm Sean. Today we're going to talk about a subject. That I did not think was interesting, but then I learned was. I polled my coworkers. I said, what do you want to talk about? And they said, why are crows so smart? And I said, nah, I didn't expect that. But then I talked to Sean. Turns out crows are fucking crazy. Yeah, so ravens and crows, I think people talk about both of those uh, species of birds. Aren't ravens mythological creatures from <laughs> Arthurian England? And Odin. And right. Odin, yeah. <laughs> he had crows. Um, Completely unrelated. <laughs> so both ravens and crows are in a family of birds called corvids, which includes like jays and magpies and rooks and jackdaws and nutcrackers <laughs> and other flappy fucks. And that totals about 120 species. And then ravens and crows are kind of in their own little grouping. No other type of animal has been so plagued by the nomenclature of English peasants. <laughs> like all those words. Yeah. Are like, hey, look at that, there's a jackdaw. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the rook, the flying. Because <laughs> yeah. a group of ravens, I mean, you say a conspiracy of ravens. Yeah. Wait, is that the formal name for a group of ravens? So it's, for, a, it's a murder of crows, right? Right. It's a murder of crows and a conspiracy of ravens. I bet you that wasn't even true until Shakespeare. I bet you Shakespeare did that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so that is one thing. I read a very angry blog post by a scientist. Really? <laughs> that was like, stop talking about those grouping names of animals as if they're like a fancy thing that some group of people like actually agree on. Right. Like nobody really gives a shit. Right. There's no scientific body that's like, it's definitely a conspiracy. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. Do you know what a conspiracy of ravens and a murder of crows was called before Shakespeare? What? A group. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, it's a group of crows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so this guy's blog post was like, it's a flock if it's a bunch of birds. Right. <laughs> and, you know, a herd for certain kinds of animals. This guy hasn't been seen since, though. Right. He's been taken down by the, the murder lobby. <laughs> the murder and conspiracy lobby. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> they teamed up for once. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's a really interesting group of birds. And I think that between corvids and parrots, you have two groups that have a lot of experiments that have been done right. related to intelligence. But I'm allergic to parrots, so we couldn't talk about that. <laughs> Even just hearing the word... <gasps> <laughs> you can barely handle it. That's not true. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, like, the reason corvids are such an interesting family is because they're smart. It's not just that they fly, they fly high. Yeah. A lot of birds can fly high. Sure, sure. These birds fucking are smart. They're smart sons of bitches. Yeah, so in this particular episode, we're going to be focusing mainly on the idea of intelligence when it comes to corvids, right? So animal intelligence and corvids, we're not really going to be talking about their biology in any other kind of capacity. They're, they're fucking birds, guys. <laughs> they fucking fly. I mean, sometimes, you know, birds can have like kind of weird, interesting things. A really close relative to corvids is the shrike family. Yeah. And shrikes, like, impale their prey on barbed wire and shit. Wow. That's funny. They sound like something out of Game of Thrones. Yeah. They sound like a different group of Viking-esque broskies, you know? Right. Like Greyjoys. So, I guess all I'm saying is, like, birds can have their own weird, cool thing, but in this particular case, corvids, we're going to be doing intelligence this episode. Do you think they're going to change the expression, jump the shark to ride the dragon, because of Game of Thrones? <laughs> <laughs> wow, the eighth season really rode the dragon. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> Maybe they should. <laughs> or melted the throne. Yeah. <laughs> the season really melted the... No, spoilers. I'm sorry, guys. 
No spoiler alerts on this show. It was, it was kind of an ass blast. Anyway, I enjoy ass blasts. I was not in love with the eighth season. <laughs> okay, guys, so let's get into... I don't like how I said that. <laughs> let's talk about crows. So smart. We're grooving. We're grooving. Yeah, we started. Oh, shit. Say some oh, words. God. <laughs> I'm so nervous. Beastie Boys. <laughs> <laughs> it, you, know, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but Spike Jones just did a documentary on the Beastie Boys, or at least it's about to be released or something. And it looks really lame to me because, like, you know, usually you want, like, a, an exciting plot or, like, Kurt Cobain committed suicide. But this one just seems like, hey, we're the Beastie Boys. And then you cut to some concert, and then you cut back, and they're like, man, we're such good friends. <laughs> and then you cut to another concert, they're kind of like, wow, we're so successful. And you're like, what is this? <laughs> like, this is just, like, the worst Instagram page. <laughs> just, like, a long litany of success. This isn't the Beastie Boys podcast. Could you, like, fucking get into the actual episode? Apparently, they were a punk band first oh and were God. failures and then got into hip-hop because they were like, there's, like, the whole mod- Market for honky cats doing rap? <laughs> That's a blue ocean strategy, yo. <laughs> they invented that term. And then dad read their book and then used it for a while. Jesus, okay. <laughs> he's a what? He's a what? Come he's on. A, he's a music man. You can start to. <laughs> no, you're, it's too late for me. This is your only job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, guys. So, so crows, man. Here, Sean, help me out here. All <laughs> I right. need a little help. Okay. Okay, so in order to kind of have this entire discussion, I think we need to spend a little bit of time first discussing like what we actually mean by intelligence. It's, it's kind of already a loaded term for humans. That's true, because right? I feel smart sometimes. Sure. Because I know about history and stuff. Okay. But then I do this pod. <laughs> <laughs> and then I feel really unintelligent. <laughs> <laughs> so intelligence, like, I mean, is it just Mensa? But Mensa's all like right wing crazies, right? Right. And, Except for I our mean, listeners. And there's like a whole thing where it's like, oh, well, what about IQ tests? And the people are like, right. IQ tests are racist. And I you have know, such a good IQ. <laughs> yeah. And then when we dive into animal intelligence, right. it gets really hard because we come at it right. with like a really anthropomorphic kind of bias. Ants have like IQ of 200, but is it cheating because they do it as groups of 10,000? Like, I don't know. <laughs> when you add up every individual <laughs> right. ant. There's like one hive of Argentine ants that has a single hive from here to Argentina. And like, <laughs> they're really smart, <laughs> but you can't really test that in a proper test setting. Sure. So there is a researcher named Dr. Kaylee Swift. And it sounds like... A really, really cute Disney star. <laughs> it sounds like she's like just now transitioning into like Zendaya style ads for Chanel. She's on Twitter at Corvid Research. And she's written about animal intelligence on her blog because it's about Corvids. And what she says is that intelligence is the ability to flexibly solve problems using cognition rather than instinct or trial and error learning. I don't care about any of that shit. Does she say murder of crows or does she say a flock? <laughs> Where does Kylie Swift go down on? I think she said murder just because that one's so fun, right? Yes. What that means is being able to apply thought to solving new problems that they haven't encountered before based on other kinds of problems that they've dealt with with the past, but like not exactly the same problem. Right? I see. So Republicans would fail an animal intelligence God. test <laughs> because any crisis happens, they're just cutting taxes. <laughs> And being like, wait, what about Social Security? You're supposed to be the the crypto Republican on this pod. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to defend the Republican Party from that. Oh, my God. Anyway. Just kidding. So, you know, based on that, when we talk about animal intelligence, we're talking about stuff like causal reasoning, imagination, mm. mental time travel, stuff like that. All the imaginative people I know are idiots. <laughs> they like can't do taxes. <laughs> but that but I see what you're getting at. Imagination part, in a broader sense. That's the part that we're curious if animals can do. Right. right? Because animals can clearly do things well. Right. right. Like they can be very skilled at doing stuff. Right. So that's not really the question that we're curious about. And they can definitely learn, right? We've definitely seen the capacity for animals to learn how a to do it. A praying things. mantis can measure the distance between it and something and then successfully calculate right. how it's gonna attack. And that's I mean, that's a pretty impressive feat of some sort of intellect. But can it imagine itself in a different circumstance? Or is that all instinctual? Right. And some of these things are kind of tricky to tease apart, like the difference between causal reasoning and associative learning. Okay. Right. So like, for example, if you imagine a billiards table, 
At a gentleman's okay. club. Okay. I'm, I've never been to anything like that, <laughs> so I can't imagine it. But I'm sure our audience, we have like nine listeners in the UK. They know what you're talking about. And, you know, you, you got some balls on the table. Okay, now we're back in my ball game. And you take like a blue ball and you roll it toward a red ball, right? So they're going to impact. <laughs> what? Okay. Why is that funny to you? It's just one of our more intimate, I don't know if you remember this, but when I got blue balls for the first time, I asked you what it was. <laughs> and you were like, that's blue balls. And I was like, that's not real. <laughs> and then I asked dad and he was like, you have blue balls. <laughs> And I was like, Dad, Father, what do I do? And he was like, jerk it out. <laughs> but anyway, you, you, but so the blue ball hits the red ball. Tell me more about these. We're keeping this in. <laughs> so, so you roll the blue ball toward the red ball, and it's going to hit, right? And right before it hits, you drop a green ball from, like, the ceiling. Okay? Right, and right, it, right. And it, it falls down next to the blue and red balls as they hit. Right. Okay. And so for you and me and for pretty much any kind of adult person, you'd be like, okay, the green ball was just a completely unrelated event that has nothing to do with the red ball moving. That's okay. very charitable of you to think, Sean. What if the green ball causes autism? <laughs> it's like, how do we know? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking as I read your notes. Is I was like, we, we really don't, like, we really don't pass these tests. <laughs> but okay, okay, so we could recognize that the green ball has nothing to do with the blue ball hitting the red ball. Right, because we have this kind of causal understanding of when one thing hits another thing and then that second thing moves... Even if we don't know the physics equations or whatever, we got an idea that there's a causal relationship there. Right? Yeah, sure. But dipship fuck fucking jumping spider watches that. Right. It can't parse out that relationship right. necessarily. And so a lot of animals would look at that and maybe they could learn to associate a blue ball and red ball hitting with the expectation of the red ball moving. Right. But they might be just as likely to learn that the green ball made the red ball move. Right. Despite never touching it. Again, this is such an indictment of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> You're a lot more pessimistic about our fellow humans. I feel like a lot of people. Do you not up on feel this. as you wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh god, <laughs> this is like if you put this in front of the Goop website, sales would plummet. <laughs> like, well, one thing I think is fun, though, for a lot of these studies, is that some of the ideas behind these studies were originally studied on like babies and kids, right? right? To understand when that kind of reasoning develops. Right. And so it is fun to think about, like, babies right. sitting there not getting that, like, right. this is the reason why these two things happen. Right. Because obviously we don't really remember being in that state. But there was a point where, like, you couldn't figure out that kind of thing. That's because so. babies don't have soul till they're five. <laughs> That's what wasn't, it pops Wasn't in there, there huh? some religion that believes that or something? That sounds familiar. Yeah. Is that just a joke I made, like, seven years ago? <laughs> it sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Either way. So a lot of studies concerning corvid intelligence happened to be done on a very specific species of crow, the New Caledonian crow. I've heard a lot about New Caledonia, I feel like, in the last couple of years. Really? Why? Well, there's a lot of geckos that are uh. popular pets from New Caledonia. That's like some island, like, kind of closest to New Zealand, or... Yeah, it's close to New Zealand and Australia, and it's owned by France. Anyway, so, New Caledonian crows happen to use a lot of tools in their everyday life. Yeah. Okay, and so that's one of the reasons why they got studied a lot. Versus other crows? Yeah, yeah. So huh. a, a lot of other crows and ravens and other corvids in general will use tools. Okay. okay. So tool use is pretty widespread, but New Caledonian right. crows make their tools in pretty interesting kinds of ways. And then based on further study, it's found that they can do a lot of innovation when it comes to tool sure, use. Sure, but through a loophole, French citizenship doesn't apply to New Caledonian crows. <laughs> And so, as that's pretty usual, you about how to troll you really hard. <laughs> and, uh, I've already forgotten what it was, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I was smirking for a while because I was like, do I hatch this plot? And <laughs> 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 I've already forgotten what it was. Yeah. I think it tells you the... the... Uh, I am kind of curious, though. Um, maybe this is just too specific and not even relevant for our conversation. Are they migratory? Like, are, or they just stay on New Caledonia? So, New Caledonia, uh, if I remember correctly, has kind of a few islands with it. And I think sometimes they can move between a couple of the islands, but they're not even really found on all of the islands, if I understand. Is it a Charles Darwin situation where he had sex with different sparrows on different islands and that created different genetic lines <laughs> and different strains of Darwin sparrow? That's actually not the <laughs> first time that Darwin has come up when I was reading New Caledonian Crows. Well, that makes sense. Um, yeah, so one of the reasons why is because they occupy a really similar niche as the finches that Darwin studied in the Galapagos. Which is kind of like nipping at bugs and shit right right and so the way that they get at a lot of those bugs 
is by using tools that they can kind of poke into holes and stuff to like get at grubs and stuff like that. It's so interesting how different something from the same family can be because European crows primarily eat witches. And so it's, <laughs> <laughs> Which is strange because they were originally familiars of the witches. But right. then Rebellion. They, yeah, they yeah. turned against their The French Revolution changed a lot of things, <laughs> right? Like this is a total reversal totally. of fortune for witches. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they were French crows either way, the New Caledonian and the French ones. It's just That's mainland true. French. It was actually the most puritanical crows that were exiled to the <laughs> islands. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> that was a lot of fuckery right there. <laughs> okay. So, we study New Caledonian crows. Right, a lot of studies relate to the New Caledonian crows concerning tools. And so, in the wild, the actual tools that they make, they'll take some twigs sometimes and they'll strip off the leaves to be able to make them better at getting into holes and stuff like that. Cool. There's a certain kind of plant in New Caledonia that has these pretty big leaves that have spikes along the edges ah. of the leaf. And so they will cut little strips of these leaves out so that they're thin enough to get into the holes but still have their kind of spikes on them and use those as hooks to capture grubs. God, that's so much smarter than me. <laughs> I was walking with Stacy recently and there's a cactus and I was like, I wonder how pokey this is. And I poked it and it hurt. And I, and I was like, I'm so stupid. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> yes. yes, in this case, the crows are smarter than you. I'm like, my memory's triggered by pain. Like, Stacy has to pinch me to remember her name. <laughs> she pinches me and I'm like, Nathan! I am Nathan! <laughs> Well, good job. I'm glad you at least have a way to learn things. <laughs> right, right. You have a methodology. That's true. Um, you have to just like flash drive your brain. Yeah. You get a little Sean quantum computer in the I back. I just plug it right in. So as like a little aside with these tools that they make, the crows display what's called laterality when it comes to making the tools. Mm. And what laterality is, is it means that they prefer to work in one direction over another. It's like people being right-handed or left-handed. And that's... A little bit rare on the species level. Cool. So being neurotic in particular is a sign of intelligence, and crows got it. It's a sign of something, and yeah, it's definitely going it's like on. a lot of Woody Allen films. Not totally clear why they do it, but they prefer to make left-handed tools as opposed to right-handed ones. Hmm. Yeah, weird. That's cool. It's weird. It just makes me feel like New Caledonian crows are like basically a bunch of post-impressionists and a bunch of <laughs> American theater guys from the 70s who just sitting there looking at Gauguin, like watching <laughs> watching New Wave and being like, lining up their tools very neatly. <laughs> and then they cry and they're like, why, there's nothing beyond the tool. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> And then they die. <laughs> I'm just a bird. <laughs> <laughs> so so these birds, they don't just make tools in the wild. They've also made tools kind of in captivity during studying. So one of the examples is that when given wire, they've bent wire into hooks mm. to be able to use to like actually like hook. So they're even hooks. stronger than me. <laughs> I think you can bend wire. I think you can be brave enough to do just, that. Uh, so depressing. But that's pretty awesome because there really aren't many animals besides humans that have actually taken some kind of bendy material like a wire right. and bent it into hook shapes for the purposes of hooking things. The only other species to mass produce microplastics. <laughs> <laughs> Birds love bendy shit. <laughs> Well, I mean, specifically these crows, I guess. Yeah. And so they've also used tools for purposes that aren't directly related to getting food, which is also pretty much just a human thing. Right. So, you know, primates will use tools, especially relatively simple ones like sticks, yeah. to be able to access food that they can't get at normally. Yeah. Right. What these birds will do is they can use stick-like tools to help them carry other objects that they can't fit in their beaks very well. So, for example, a lot of these objects that they carry are man-made ones, like big beads with, like, a hole through the center. Cool. Right? And so the bead is too big for them to actually fit in their mouths, but they're interested in it and they want to, like, mess around and play with it. Right. So they'll take a stick that they can carry, stick it through the hole, and then carry the bead away. Sure. And that's a pretty weird That's cool. So they're like behavior. hipsters at a coffee shop. Just can't get enough of them pokas. <laughs> just as they mash. Just, I mean, that's me stealing a Louis C.K. bit, so I'm not going to continue. <laughs> Point is, is they make their coffee really well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so also in lab, these crows have exhibited the ability to make what are called compound tools. Okay. Okay. So the idea with that is they're given multiple pieces that you need to fit together to be able to make a tool that actually functions the way they need it to. Right. The food that they're going after is stuck inside of a box but they can't actually get at the food with any of the sticks that they have because the sticks aren't long enough. 
but they're given sticks and straws that they can shove the sticks into. Okay. And when you shove a stick into a straw, then you can make a tool that's long enough for them to get at the food. And they can do it. Yeah. And they can do it without having to go through too many trials of figuring it out, basically. So, you know, that's a pretty complicated behavior that involves sort of a different kind of understanding of what tools can do for you. God, just makes you so sad. Why? Well, just like we underfund our rural school so much, and that's why they can't do this. (laughs) Holy shit. (laughs) Do you think of all the children who don't know how to make compound tools because we've underfunded our rural education? (laughs) (laughs) They can do it. We need to stop censoring textbooks, okay? (laughs) If anything, it's the city slickers. That's true. That have never had to hold a tool in their lives. I was first going to (laughs) joke about urban schools, but that's racist. (laughs) I'm I'm thinking about, like, Manhattan Beach white Uh, middle class or rich uh, schools where, like, they've never held a tool. That's true. Their hands can't manipulate the tools properly to yeah, be able to like actually pudgy. <laughs> Their parents are giving them CBD being like, I don't want you to get high out there. They're all Augustus Gloop or whatever from, uh, <laughs> from Willy Wonka. Okay. <laughs> and then the last part in this tool category is that crows have also made what are called meta tools or used what are called meta tools. That's like the meme generators you guys have been sending to me recently. <laughs> yeah, the AI I don't know what run. any of that shit means. <laughs> no, no. So what these meta tools are is the idea that crows need to be able to recognize that tools can be useful to help you get other tools to finally achieve your goal. Because, mm. you know, there's a certain kind of cognition where you recognize a tool can be useful to help you get food immediately. Right. Right. But... The idea that you have to string along several goals on the way to your final goal. I need to use tool A to get tool B so that I can use tool B to get my food. Right. Right. That's a more complicated set of thoughts. And it requires you to think of tools as separate things that can achieve intermediate goals. And the crows were able to do this. Basically, a short stick was hung on a string, a longer stick was kind of held in this cage that the crows could not get at on their own, but could get at it with the shorter stick. And then they could use the longer stick to get the meat out of a box so that they could finally eat the meat. And crows solved this pretty well. There was one crow in the experiment that actually solved it on their first try. After basically hanging out, looking at all of the stuff, you know, hopping around, looking at the stuff for about two minutes. And then in that process, figured out what they needed to do and then just went at it and and solved the... uh... That really puts my portal runtime to shame. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, I did the same. I did like level one 70 times. (laughs) Portal is probably a pretty good example of (laughs) what a crow could do and I can't. (laughs) Our equivalent challenge here. (laughs) By the 70th time, the portal's like, press the left (laughs) mouse key! And I was like, which one? And it's like, left! (laughs) They had programmed like a really angry Stephen Merchant. (laughs) So tool use is pretty crazy, and it's a very cool thing that these new Caledonian crows and some other corvids can do. Let's take a break, and then I'm going to talk to you about another intelligence experiment that has to do with inference of material properties. Awesome. Fifteen love. Do you like to listen to the sounds of intramural tennis. Ah! Deuce. Download balls in your court today. (laughs) And that's match. Guys, we're back. Sean, tell me, what is inference? (laughs) Apparently crows can do it. I can't infer the meaning of inference. You need to tell me what's going on. Yeah, so it's a thought process where you can well, use that's where, other... That's inf- where I broke down for me. <laughs> where you can use other information to figure out something that you can't directly observe. Sure. Okay. So, for example, vaccines become common. Autism goes up. I can infer <laughs> that vaccines oh cause autism. You son of a bitch. <laughs> Why are you like this? <laughs> you know, crows all get vaccinated. All right. <laughs> crows are like the data's there. <laughs> like, of it course is, they get vaccinated. Yeah, they're very reasonable. <laughs> it is rare for a non-human species to infer the properties of an object by indirectly observing them. Right. Okay. So a lot of animals will go up to things and, like, directly touch them, lift them, and figure out stuff about them. Classic pussycat. Going, bow, meow, meow, with the ball. <laughs> so, so... <laughs> what uh, does the ball do? So, for example, one example of this kind of inference process is... 
if you think about like a seesaw, okay, and you have a box on either side of the seesaw. Yes. And the seesaw is tilted all the way so that one of the boxes is down and the other one's up in the air. <laughs> what the shit? I never had a seesaw as a baby. <laughs> <laughs> My pop was too poor. <laughs> Okay. But, <laughs> okay, so you got a seesaw, two boxes. Yeah, and one of them's all the way down, mm. and the other one's up in the air, right? Uh-huh. You can infer that the box that's down was heavier than the other box, okay? Because that's the way that seesaws work. Heavier things will pull down that side of the seesaw. That's the one with the dead body. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Agatha Christie's 1933 classic, Seesaw. <laughs> yes, that's the one with the dead body. And that's the kind of inference that we can do that many primates, for example, fail at. Right, Schrodinger's cat is like, I don't know what the fuck is going on with these boxes. <laughs> when he's the one inside! This is the kind of free associating you're doing, is saying stupid <laughs> shit like this? God damn it. What, it's a box that's heavy. People are going to have such a hard time following the already complicated shit I'm saying, <laughs> because you're just saying stupid shit. I thought you said the see something was simple. <laughs> I, I'm trying to use it as a simplifying thing. Okay, okay, yes, yes, yes. You're using a lot of naughty words. Okay, so, we have a seesaw, there's two boxes on either side, one of them's heavy, and that makes the seesaw go down. We can understand and infer that there's something heavy in that box. Primates don't know what the fuck is going on. Right. So for them to be able to pick that up, they would need to actually go over and lift up that box and realize that it's heavier. Right. right. Like, they... like chimps? Yeah. Crows are smarter than chimps? Well, so... Well, we're not there yet. Right. Until this experiment, it was not clear if any non-human animal is able to do this kind of inference. Okay. Right. It used to be part of that winnowing list of like why humans are special. Right. And yes. now it's just dildos. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so one of the other things that Dr. Kaylee Swift mentions in her blog is that like there is this weird sort of competition bent to like all of the intelligence discussion. Right. right which right. is like which is like in what ways are people better than animals? You yeah. know what I mean? Be- or yeah. weirdly vice versa, right? So people are like, you know, actually Elephants can talk. Right. So there is a bias, I think, on the other direction from a lot of biologists that they will admit, which is that they want animals to have a lot of qualities that are either unique or seem profound or important. Right. Right. And and I totally get it. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why this Corvid stuff is so cool. You're the same way with myoblastus. You <laughs> anthropomorphize them all the time so that people will care. Okay. <laughs> so... The way that they wanted to do this experiment for the crows is to do another one related to weight, okay? But in this case, they're dealing with the fact that things that are heavier don't get blown in the wind as much as things that are lighter. Okay. Okay, That wind can make light things kind of fly all over the place, but heavy things don't move as much. Okay. And so basically, they set up a bunch of different objects that are either light or heavy. Okay. And then they suspended them in front of a fan... And when the fan's turned on, you can kind of see if they're moving a lot or not. Right, okay. And so then they took crows and they trained the crows to be in one of two groups. In one group, when the crow takes a heavy object and drops it into a little container, they get some food. Other group of crows, if they drop a light object into the container, they get some food. Cool. Okay. So that means some crows like heavy stuff now and some crows like light stuff. Okay, cool. But in that training time period, they always got to pick up the objects. Okay. To actually feel how heavy they are. Right. But now in the actual experiment, they just have to watch these objects get blown in the wind. Right. And just ruminate. Yeah. And wonder about existence. Yeah. And think about it. And then they go and pick which object they're going to try to take over to try to get some food. Okay. And so if... They are just picking at random, right? If the wind blowing doesn't help them at all, then they'll get it wrong about as often as they get it right. It's about a 50-50 shot. But what they found is that actually these crows were much more successful than you would see by just random chance. So the 73% of the time, they picked out the object that they actually wanted. So heavy crows picked the heavy object. Light crows picked the light object. Right. So that means that there's some kind of information that they actually picked up from the actual wind blowing that helped them infer what the weight of these objects were. Smart fuckers. So really the only difference in the intelligence of a crow and a human is that a crow is always using their intelligence for some sort of pragmatic end, whereas a human will sometimes use intelligence for things like developing regimental warfare and love actually. They'll waste it. Yes. Um, (laughs) They'll throw it away. So I I will say that there are some experiments that crows do not succeed at. They're not always like... Right, so one of the kinds of 
inference that crows don't seem to care about right is when they have to observe the causality of two things that has nothing to do with them doing something right they don't give a fuck and then put themselves into that situation later so what i mean is oh. in this experiment that the crows failed at but babies baby humans succeeded at we're we're yeah <laughs> this, 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 this is one babies beat the crows five yeah. points for <laughs> so so the way this experiment worked was like a block falling onto a button and then that sort of releasing some food. Okay. Okay. Or like a treat for the baby or something. Okay. Yeah. Um, Has the rock ever hit the baby? <laughs> <laughs> no. The, 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 the babies were kept away. Um, so, yeah, because they would definitely just crawl under the block and die. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, the, the point after seeing that happen, block falls onto the button, food is released. Babies at a certain age can just go up to the button and push it themselves. Okay. Because they'll recognize that really the point that's important is the button getting depressed, not okay. the brick falling or right. whatever, right? But crows are just like, I don't even give a fuck. Yeah, if crows would do anything, they would work to make the brick fall again. Okay. In the sense that like they would try They'd to fly repeat up, it that whole process. It. Right, yeah. exactly. Instead yeah. of realizing that they themselves can just replace the brick. It's not important there. Okay. Right? So in that case, you know, crows don't always beat babies. <laughs> right. They're kind of like horny greasers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How are they like horny greaser? Well, because a horny greaser, like, let's say they, they, you know, they win a race, so they get the girl. But, uh -huh. like, they don't really know it's because they just happened to be nice one time. And the girl's like, oh, you know, he's actually not so bad. I think it's because it's so cool. So Danny Zuko's like, oh, I gotta be really cool. Fuck. And really he hasn't inferred that what's important is to open his heart to Sandy. I see. I see. I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> <laughs> I should have just let that lay there. Oh, boy. Um, okay. So, and then another kind of experiment here that I want to get into has to do with a peephole. The peephole experiment. I don't... Yeah, I know this is rare for me, but I don't think we can talk about this section, <laughs> Sean. Okay. So this has to do with a kind of intelligence called the theory of the mind, or a theory of mind. Okay. And the idea there is that we can sometimes, <laughs> maybe not all of us, we can imagine a mental state that we have existing in another person. So we can imagine somebody else being happy, or somebody else seeing something or experiencing something. Yeah, Donald Trump imagines everyone always wanting to eat a burger from McDonald's. <laughs> well, so, some he people... Like, he, like, meets heads of states like Kim Jong-un, he's a burger. That's why he gets along with dictators, is they all like McDonald's. Because Angela Merkel is like, here's a burger, and she's like, what is this? And he's like, who are you? So Some people have a harder time with this than others. Um, <laughs> so an example of... Uh, so kids do not have a theory of mind right from birth okay it that's very interesting it takes some years and so there's actually wow. a, an experiment related to this there's a lot of forms of it but one way that it happens is like for example a box filled with cookies or something like that okay is sitting out on a table that's where a kid puts all of his cookies okay so okay. all the cookies he knows it's on the table right he walks out of the room his mom comes in takes that box of cookies and puts it in the cabinet okay okay so if you explain that set of events to a kid and then ask the kid when the boy walks back into the room where does he think the cookies are okay. kids above a certain age will say on the table and then kids below a certain age will say in the cabinet wow okay because those kids below a certain age don't realize that the information they have might not be the information that the kid has that wow. this kid in the story has a separate mind with different amounts of information and might not know everything that you know. Dude, that's fucking creepy Wachowski sibling shit. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, dude. Tabula rasa. Right. So John Locke was right and Kant was wrong. <laughs> or are there a priori categories of thought? There are. Or there are elements of cognition that exist in humans when they're born. But there's a lot of them that develop over time. A lot Interesting. of them. And that's one of them, is wow. this theory of mind that we can imagine people having different sets of information as us. So there's not a single continental philosopher from the 17 and 1800s <laughs> who alone has the truth. Who got it 100% right. Instead, in, <laughs> instead, the quote-unquote capital T truth is an amalgam and a complex empirical process of discovery. That's beautiful. Hence, hence, hence Petri dish. Yes. The scientific revolution. That is what we are. So... It's definitely been clear for a very long time that animals can see something and react to it, but what's more controversial is to say that animals can imagine other animals having some kind of cognition themselves. Right. Right? Uh, just like kids below a certain age don't do this. Oh, we kind of have a hard time imagining animals having cognition. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. Sometimes we'll see dogs or something like that, and we'll be like, oh, this dog 
feels this kind of thing or you know what right. and really the dog is thinking red rum red <laughs> rum <laughs> well it's just i think humans are willing to move their thought processes into other people and animals right but it's not clear i mean <laughs> for some people they're not sure that some animals have thought processes at all right but even if they do do they ever transfer that into other animals and fucking crows do Yes. So Holy shit. So in this case, this is a study with common ravens. Okay, so okay. not even the New Caledonian crow. Now we're, we're just doing ravens. How related are ravens and crows? I mean, they're the same family, but... They're the same genus also. Okay, I've always been a little confused about the difference, actually. But they yeah. are different species. So there are several species of crow and several species of raven. Okay, and, I see. Uh, they're actually not... At that point, something that you can group together, like, genetically. So oh, okay. there are some ravens that are more closely related to some crows and vice versa. So it's kind of the the kind of goofy mix of a Linnaean... Linnaean? How do you say that? Sure. Linnaeus. How do you say Lin- it? Uh, <laughs> wow, that's up. a hard word. Linnaean, yeah. But, but basically what I'm getting at is that the nomenclature is kind of a legacy. It's not necessarily... It doesn't map yeah. onto our modern genetic understanding. Yeah, yeah. And at this point, it's so mixed up, there's really no, there's no movement to change it. They're just names at this point. Largely, the main thing is that morphologically, ravens are larger than crows. That's pretty much the the main factor. There are certain elements of like, what their wing and tail shape is during flight, et cetera, et cetera. But the biggest thing is that ravens, by virtue of their majesty, are the birds of Odin, whereas crows are the murder of, of, of witches. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, one common thing that ravens do is they like to store their food in little caches or, or treasure troves. Right, just okay. like I do. <laughs> yes. It's like <laughs> an old pastrami sandwich <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like underneath <laughs> the fridge. <laughs> Stacy will never find it. It's mine. In between the couch cushions and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got my nuts for winter. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that ravens will do is they'll kind of nervously be on the lookout when they're going to go to their treasure trove to make sure they're not being observed when they store their stuff. It's a very neurotic creature. Yeah, but, you know, that kind of makes sense. They don't want to get robbed by conspecifics, by other ravens. Right. That's why it's always so hard to persuade ravens to buy into a welfare state, <laughs> is they really believe in the mythology <laughs> that, that someone will take their money and waste it. So then the question is, why do ravens kind of look over their shoulder, and why do they behave differently if they do see another raven looking at them? They'll like, they'll purposefully not go to their little cache, okay? Is it because that's an association that they've learned over time, right? There's been enough times where, oh, hey, I see a raven looking at me, and every time I see a raven looking at me, my food gets stolen, right? <laughs> right so then they're sure. just like, don't go to my food when there's another raven looking at me. Somehow your delivery reminded me of John Mulaney. And somehow that food gets stolen. <laughs> wow, that was really good. That was really beautiful. It got way funnier just because you said it like that. <laughs> Very funny. Can you just imagine a crow voice by John Mulaney? <laughs> like somehow. If, if, if it was a detective raven voiced by John Mulaney, I feel like that's going places. Okay. That's, that's a cartoon show I could get behind. Stop the podcast. <laughs> We've got something to do, boys. All right. Or is it not a learned association? Is it that when a raven sees another raven looking at them, they're imagining that raven watching them for a purpose. Maybe the same purpose that they watch other ravens so that they can steal their shit, right? Like, are all ravens little kleptomaniac fucks? And so the reason why they're nervous and always watching over their shoulders is because they know they like to steal stuff. And other ravens must like to steal stuff too, right? In that case, that is them taking their mind and putting it into another animal. That's pretty cool. So which one is it, though? Right? That, that also implies they have open brain surgery, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But like... then you mix up the Abby normal brain. <laughs> right. And then... Uh... We're seeing the limits of my intelligence. I cannot imagine uh, the mind except as a physical entity. <laughs> Whereas we know the mind is really the soul. It's a metaphysical construct. Right, yes, of course. Yes. Or the quantum state of the mind. Exactly. Or demons. In between the multiverse. <laughs> um, the subtle knife. <laughs> So, some researchers wanted to know. To perform this experiment, researchers put some ravens in a little box that has this peephole that can be... <laughs> what? I'm sorry, just peepholes. Why? <laughs> are you thinking about glory holes? You need to stop. <laughs> peepholes are glory holes for the eye. You need to stop participating in glory holes. <laughs> Very naughty of Don't tell people about it. <laughs> anyway, so this peephole can be open or shut. Right? Okay. And so... <laughs> Why? <laughs> Let me get over myself. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. So, so the people, the ravens in there, oh. and 
It's open and they're looking through. And as they're looking through, they can kind of observe around the rest of the room. Cool. And they can see sort of like what areas are in sight from being inside the box. Okay. Right? And then when you take the raven outside of the box, you let it kind of roam around the rest of the room. They'll often do things like hide little bits of food into little caches in that room and everything. Okay. One out of ten ravens just walk around saying, I want to be back in the box! <laughs> I want to be back in the box! So now, the situation is, if you had another raven in that room, the first raven will get kind of nervous about going back to their treasure trove, right? <laughs> what a terrible life. Well, because they just don't want to be watched. Right, and right. They'll, they'll wait. Like, ravens will do behaviors where... They don't feel nervous if there's something blocking the line of sight between right. them and the other raven, right? So they'll prefer treasure troves that are places where that other raven can't see based right. on where their current position is. Ravens are like Clint Eastwood from Gran Turismo. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, so territorial and angry, you know? They're like Clint Eastwood from a lot of his movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> if you take the, the second raven and you put it inside of the box now, the first raven will also alter its behavior based on whether the peephole is open or not. So they'll be able to recognize like, okay, just because that other raven is nearby doesn't necessarily mean that they can see me. But if the peephole is open, then that means that there's a chance that they could spot me. And so I can't go to my treasure trove, okay? And that's important because concerning the whole peephole thing and everything, even if there's not a raven in that box, even if it's just sound, like a little speaker playing raven noises. So, raven A looks over. It can't see a raven at all. It's not that the sight of another raven bothers them. Yeah. It's the idea that another raven might be able to observe them through the peephole. Just the sound of them. That's fucked. That sets them off. Wow. Okay. And what that means is that it's not just a learned association because you can see them looking. Right. It's just this more imaginative process. Right. Obama's not literally in the chair that Clint Eastwood is yelling at. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He associates the empty chair with a lack of leadership. Right. Perfect. <laughs> that is exactly what happened. Clint Eastwood didn't know what we were talking about in this episode. And then he heard that and he's like, I remember. Now I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Crow intelligence. Thanks for listening, Clint Eastwood. <laughs> um, okay. Let's take a break. And then when we get back, I'm going to talk about the last kind of crazy raven crow intelligence thing that i learned about this one was actually really hard for me to get because it's neurosciencey shit cool and it's a really tough that's deal. a great smarter than sean <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly so, so <laughs> when we get back we'll talk about yeah. that it was 805 p.m one john doe approached his car i did not know the man but i had heard him having an argument with his wife so i knew i would not be the prime suspect i found a discarded lead pipe in the gutter and struck him three times across the head. Then my only problem was where to discard the body. This is Really True Crime, the first podcast brought to you by Real True Criminals. I had never seen her naked body, but I had oft imagined it in my more pensive moments. Good for strangling, I thought. As I strangled her, Every week, we recount our own true criminal activities to you to satisfy those dark urges within. Join us on Tuesdays, wherever podcasts are. Okay, guys. Oh, I was kind of groaning there. I'm so strong. We're back, but Nathan's shirt isn't. <laughs> he popped that one off. <laughs> My shirt didn't make it back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's talk about this last one. And this took a lot of reading because neuroscience, uh, it's got a lot of ideas and terms that are specific to that field. And so I had to do okay. a lot of extra reading to figure this out. Well, I mean, what are we talking about? Like fucking doing philosophy then? Like what would... So this has to do with counting stuff. Okay. So counting's hard? I don't know why I'm saying it like that. I can't count past 12. The so. neuroscience of counting is something that is kind of difficult to understand, mm -hmm. but also represents, I think, a really impressive feat of science in that we actually understand it really a lot better than we used to in the past 20 years. Okay. And the answers are pretty cool. So the way that, because I thought it was intuitive, the way I imagine is I count. I just count one. And then a little foreman in my brain goes, it's one! Uh -huh. And then a little guy that goes like, it's 
what? Uh-huh. <laughs> and just yells it all the way back okay. to command person. Okay. He doesn't know what to do with that information. Okay. <laughs> but that's how I imagine it in my brain. But what if it's five then? What happens? Dude, I've never had to go to five. Well, okay. But see, so here is the thing is, you know, obviously there's a sensory input part where it's like, oh, your eyeballs have to see. Right. Five cows or one okay. cow or whatever, right? Right. But then once it starts to go into your brain, there's some complex judgments that have to happen. I mean, first of okay. all, we can see two jabronis and two cows and recognize that those are different things, but also that there was two of both of them, right? It's a really derogatory way to talk about jabroni's girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds, you can take what you can get, okay? Um, but in any case, there's two of them, right? Yeah. And so we can also recognize that they share that in common. In other words, that the number of something, the quantity of something, is something beyond just the actual physical object that it is. Okay. And there's this kind of abstraction and complex thought that's involved that happens in our neocortex. Okay. What the fuck is a neocortex? Neocortex is a part of the brain. It's kind of the outermost part of your brain that kind of formed. It, the... it forms if you've seen the Matrix. <laughs> it formed the most recently in evolution. Okay. okay. That's pretty cool. Um, so crows don't have it. Right. Oh, shit. Yes. Okay, but so so you see two jabronis. Yeah. And two cows. Sure. Okay. Whoop, 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 into the brain. Yeah. What happens on like the fucking neuronal level? Right. And so that's part. Question one. Is how do you actually even tell two or four or one? Is it is it that you have counting neurons that if it's a single thing, one counting neuron goes off? If it's four things, four counting neurons go off, right? Are you adding together neuron signals? Oh, huh. Is that how you count? Huh. Or is there a five neuron and a seven neuron? And when the seven neuron shouts, it's because you're seeing seven things. Right. Right? So are there specific neurons for specific numbers? Or do you add up the magnitude of the signal? And what's the answer? Yeah. The answer, <laughs> the answer is actually that second one. Okay. Which is you have specific number neurons. Okay, cool. One that's responsible for lighting up. When you see five things, one that's supposed to light up when you see 15 things. Okay, so when you see six cows, yeah. there's a neuron in your brain who's like the dipshit younger brother of Amy Poehler's character who just wears a six shirt and he goes, six! Yeah. Uh, interesting. Yeah. And there's another part of your brain that will be like, cows! And then somewhere that gets integrated in six cows! So they gotta run together and yeah. be like, six cows? Six cows! Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's pretty funny. But, what that's called is labeled line coding, okay? As okay. opposed to the other option that we were talking about, which is summation coding. Or in other words, that conceptual idea is you're adding together a bunch of neurons that are getting excited about something. When we discovered line coding was right, did the guy with the other theory like go to a bar and get drunk because his whole <laughs> life's work had been disproven? I think so, yeah, probably. <laughs> Science is harsh. <laughs> yeah, although, so the, the thing about the kind of abstract concepts of summation coding and labeled line coding is that summation coding does appear to be true for certain kinds of perception, okay? That's it. Like, there are certain ways that we perceive colors and not all colors are primary colors. They're mixes of different wavelengths of light. Right. Those get summed together because the specific neurons right. are picking up specific wavelengths. Nathan shirtless beige. Exactly. Stacy fuchsia dress. Yes. Mm. Wow. Great. Wow. I'm glad that was Useful taking up time examples. in our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So you see two cows and this process happens. What happens if you just see the writing two cows? Like, is it different when you see the symbols that is writing? Yeah, so my understanding is that that is different in that it gets looped into a part of your brain. And actually, the funny thing about seeing two cows is you might actually still have the two neuron go off because it's two words. And oh, you interesting. Still count them. But I'm pretty sure that the language center has to get involved in the interpretation. Okay, that. but these two damn cows. <laughs> the two neuron <laughs> is like, what the fuck? Yeah, exactly. The three neuron will go off inappropriately. <laughs> So this information already on its own, we haven't even talked about crows yet. This is already fucking crazy to me. Okay, uh, like this is pretty wild shit to know that there are neurons where like through the course of evolution, counting was useful enough to us. Right. That we have neurons dedicated to just getting excited when we see that number of things. That makes a lot of sense though. It does I mean, make sense. And what sense, we're going to see with crows impressive. is that things convergently evolve to right. get to that skill set. So that's a thing. valuable skill set. In primate brains, that happens in the parietal cortex, which is part of the neocortex part of your brain, which, as we said, is kind of a more recent evolutionary thing. Right. It happened more recently than 
our split from birds. Right. And so... Those... That happens in the paleoconservative cortex of birds. <laughs> so um, in the birds, it's like, okay, birds can count. We already know that birds are able to count. Yeah. All right. But... Do they count the same kind of way, or do they do summation coding, for example? Right, right? that's interesting. There's no reason why we both have to do this kind of labeled line coding, you know? Evolution could have picked a different path that time. Okay. But what we found is that birds actually appear to do the same kind of coding as we do, with the same kind of neurons, but in a different part of their brains. (laughs) So this is a really big convergent evolution moment. Damn. And what that means when we see instances of convergent evolution is you, you might then consider, oh... Maybe because they picked the same solution, maybe that solution is actually like a pretty good one. Maybe it's a kind of efficient to do labeled line coding for counting. Right. If it happens one time, it's just kind of evolution worked its way there. Sure. If it happens a few times, then it's like, okay, well, that's that's good. Right. Maybe there's an actual benefit or maybe it's particularly efficient. And so the way that this experiment worked, both for primates, people, and birds, was it was basically a memory game. They would show you a little picture with circles on it, some number of circles. Okay. And then they would blank out the picture so you can't see it anymore. And then a second or two later, they would put up a new picture and you would need to see, is it the same number of circles as before? So the first picture, you're like, oh, that's seven circles. Next picture shows up. You need to remember, oh, the last one was seven. Right. This one is also seven. And then you hit a button and you get a treat every time that you're correct. Cool. Okay. But the new picture or a Twix or (laughs) (laughs) is it just seed? (laughs) I I, I think it was a piece of meat for the ravens and it was some kind of. I'll take a piece of meat. It was like candy for the primates or something. Give me the meat. (laughs) So, (laughs) so the idea is that in that case, it doesn't have to be exactly the same number of circles. Like it could have been wrong, right? right? They could have picked a picture that was a different amount. And then every once in a while, the primate or the bird will get it wrong. And then they don't get a treat. And cool. Sad. One of the interesting things is that both primates and birds are more likely to get it wrong if the second number of circles is similar to the first number. Right. Okay. So if the first number is like 15 circles and then the second bunch is like 14 circles, if you're looking really quick... You might get that wrong, right? Right. Because it looks pretty similar. Right. Whereas if it were 15 circles and the next one's like five circles, you're like, oh, that's clearly different. Right. Right. And one of the interesting things about the way that our brains work is that the bigger the numbers are, the bigger the difference it has to be. To be recognizable. Yeah. Tell the difference between them. Right. Right. So if we're talking about 200 cows versus 190 cows... That 10 cow difference really doesn't look like much to us. But it was good enough when it was 15 cows and 5 cows. Right, that that makes sense. That does make sense. But it doesn't have to be that way, right? There's actually no strict reason why we had to do that. Besides that, it seems like that's the kind of thing that makes sense to us uh, as far as, like, reason is concerned. Like, oh, well, you know, maybe it's harder to see bigger amounts of stuff. But that's called non-linear compression in that how good we are at distinguishing those amounts changes the bigger the number of things we're counting. Cool. And it's actually a log relationship, a logarithmic nonlinear compression in our brains. That is the same for birds also. There's certain moments in the pod where I just trust that our viewers are smarter than me. (laughs) Well, what what part of what I said is weird? I've just heard the term logarithmic used a lot in my life, and I'm never going to actually know what logarithmic means. I've technically done those equations. I got a C on that test. Like, I don't really know what's going on. Logarithmic means that for every power of something, you have some kind of linear step. So what that means, like, for example, in terms of our viewers, okay, okay, or or listeners, listeners to the podcast. We're talking about you guys. Is how excited do we get when we get new listeners? Is it linear or is it logarithmic? And linear would mean every time we get 10 more listeners, we get the same amount of excitement. Right. Okay. Logarithmic would be our first listener, Lots of excitement. Right. The 10th listener, lots of excitement. The 100th listener, lots of excitement. So we're going by multiples of 10. Uh, A thousand listeners, same amount of excitement. Okay. Right? So I'm neither. My excitement is retrograde amnesiatic, <laughs> which is every single new listener to our climate change episode, I break down and cry. <laughs> we got listeners? Yeah. Is this being recorded? <laughs> that episode ticked up from 20 to 21, like last week, and I like sobbed. <laughs> In any case, so that is the different kinds of scaling. Linear means that it's the same amount that gets the same amount of response okay. each time. 
And logarithmic means that you need to go by like multiples or powers okay. of two or 10 or whatever. Okay, cool. So in the case of birds and primates, we have this nonlinear compression, a logarithmic compression okay. on this counting and how much we get counting wrong. Okay, sure. And that's another thing that did not necessarily have to converge like right. that. Birds could have been just as shitty at counting big numbers as small numbers. Right. There's no reason why it had to work out that way. Right. I mean, it's interesting because there's an intuitive... It makes a lot of sense why counting would work like that. Because sure. it does feel irrelevant whether it's 200 or 190 cows. Yeah. Unless you're a miser. And it makes sense why that would be true for crows. But it's kind of cool that like crows would operate under the same logic and thus converge. Yeah. And to be fair, I think another way of thinking about it also is... There's no necessarily good reason why crows would need to count that many things. Right. You know, you, you could just imagine them being really good at counting stuff up to like 20. And then yeah. after that, them just never giving a shit about counting ever again. I mean, as was true with pre-capitalist humans. <laughs> Until we became greedy. <laughs> we, we got past fingers and toes yeah. and then. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you don't really need to count in any particular fashion for the first apple from the Garden of Eden. Oh. But once Adam took the 5,000th and put them all in Costco plastic, <laughs> God cussed them out. <laughs> wow, is that how that happened? And, and God put a hard cap on our ability to count. Before we were cast from Eden... Adam could just count fucking perfectly, endlessly. This reminds me a little bit of Tower of Babel, kind of, but with counting. Yeah, sort of yeah, thing. yeah. The Very law of the Tower of Apples. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In summation. Damn. Corvids. Smart. Yeah. I like it. We've gone over it. They can fly. <laughs> They're common in Western literature. Yeah. And uh, some other stuff. What was the stuff we talked about? <laughs> <laughs> We talked about how they display a lot of different kinds of intelligence. Fucking inference? That's crazy. The counting? Right. And that their way of counting neurologically is actually very similar to human counting. And that they're able to come up with a lot of clever uses for tools, including uses that don't directly relate to food. And in that sense, don't necessarily directly lead to a reward. Right. right? Crow's already smarter than the average American. <laughs> <laughs> right? I think basically... These birds are real smart. Yeah. They're very cool. How long do they live? In the wild, they'll live up into their teens, probably. Especially wow. if they make it out of their first four or five years. Right. Those are the rough ones. Right. And then they're really likely to make it into their teens. And then in captivity, as far as I understand, they can make it up into their 20s. That's incredible. I mean, that means they're testing AP test percentile ranges. <laughs> like... <laughs> Way before American students, you know? <laughs> yeah, doing a great job. Yeah. You know, I think there's a lot of other kinds of animals that display different characteristics of what we would call intelligence. And even among birds, parrots are another example of birds that show certain kinds of intelligence. And in a couple of, like, experiments where they did head-to-head -head comparisons. Right. In some cases, there are certain kinds of problems that ravens solve really well that certain kinds of parrots solve really poorly and vice versa. Right. So there's interesting biases and in kinds of intelligence. It just goes to show that I think, first of all, there's a really big diversity in cognition in the natural world. Yeah. And not all those kinds of cognition is useful to every kind of animal all the time. That's right? why we shouldn't be so weird and dogmatic about like an adjective like intelligence, right? Sure. Like we should have a flexible definition. Yeah. Just like motile or non-motile eggs. Yes. Okay. I mean, eggs are non motile Yeah, I got you. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. Yes. My, my eggs are motile. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, guys, <laughs> that's everything we've got to say about a conspiracy of ravens and a murder of crows. If you like what you're hearing, please support us by leaving us a review wherever you listen to podcasts and by signing up at patreon.com slash petri dish. You can tweet at us at Dish Podcast. Email us at PetriDishPod at gmail.com. Guys, we want to say thank you to Stacy Song, our sound lord and engineer. Brian Allen. Stay safe, Brian Allen. Okay, our art man. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>
Thanks again for listening to Comedy by Indie Drop-In. If you would like your show featured, reach out to us at Indie Drop-In on all social media or go to IndieDropIn.com. See you next time.